Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. I think it's, it's really important to first start about where I am before I say who I am, because context is everything for me. I am in Nairobi, Kenya, and the beauty about this place is that it's known as the Garden City. One of the only cities in the world that has a national park in it, um, which means that one of our major roads sometimes has lions crossing it, um, and not in a nostalgic kind of way, in a very scary kind of way, because they're supposed to be contained. This context is where I've been raised and where I've been brought up, a green garden city. But because of urbanization, this is all changing. I am an architect. Um, I'm passionate about a sustainable design and affordable housing, and I'm trying to sort of change the narrative on this. I'm practicing here in Nairobi with a company called Build X Studio, and I'm also a lecturer at the University of Nairobi. But in all this, my passion is in bringing sustainable development to Kenya locally and beyond, um, and just sort of the the declassifying it, not making it a classist thing, sustainable design. It can be for everyone and it should be for every kind of development. Precarity is something that we are all too familiar with just coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's really easy for people to understand that the precariousness of our current situation is that we don't have inbuilt resilience as communities. Communities, cities, developed, undeveloped, all manners of human development is not built to be resilient. An example would be flooding. Flooding and also the inconsistent weather climate patterns that are changing completely dishevels a, a community such as ours. And I'm saying this with a country that is a 60% agricultural economy. So one thing that we're trying to tackle is how do we bring it back home? How do we make people realize that you know climate change is is something that is affecting them. The second thing, as I mentioned, is flooding. The instances of flooding keep increasing every year. And flooding is actually a very natural or normal natural phenomenon. So it's quite interesting that we can't seem to deal with flooding. But every single year in the Kenyan context, for example, 200 to 300 people die from flooding and over 200,000 people are displaced. The same people who build the house last year that was destroyed, build the house again. And it's this idea again that this is not my problem. Somebody is causing this to me. And as architects, as professionals, as uh, lecturers, it's about changing the way we speak about these things. First of all, as a civilization, we have been able to build in flood prone areas. You can build in a way that your house isn't displaced every single year. And then that brings me to the third thing, which is everyone wants to live in the same place. People follow where work is. So urbanization is going to keep happening and we're all going to want to live in the same place. Um, but we, have, we haven't prepared for this. In Kenya, we have separated the country into counties. We have decentralized the government. So money is going into the different counties. It means that the counties or the rural areas and the towns have money to develop. They have money for infrastructure, they have money for services, they have money for all these things. And so there's opportunity for people to stay in the countryside and create work opportunities in that context. And then this ties into my last point, which is that developing nations, and Kenya is, you know, it's been independent for 50 years. 50 years old means that my grandmother and my father lived during col colonial times. And that means that when you're trying to advocate for people to, first of all, look at climate change, that was my first point, don't build like this in flood prone areas, or you don't need to live in the city to be prosperous. Those three conversations cannot be had without first dealing with what I call daddy issues, which is that our current generation was, was fathered by the British colonial uh, rulers who told us, you know, if you live in a stone house on the top of a hill in the city near the marketplace, that is prosperity. That is the people who are taking charge of you. Um, and just before that, we used to live in communities um, that were predetermined in earth houses with thatched roofs, um, which I'm not even advocating that that's the way to go. What I'm saying is that to be able to go to a future that is 
sustainable, that our cities are healthy and great places to live in using natural building materials, we have to deal with the fact that our idea of prosperity, our idea of class, is broken up by the fact that we were colonized for very many years and those ideas were given to us um, by, by our previous fathers, per se. And I hope that gives some context. So at BuildX, we, we recognize that the problem is huge. Uh, we recognize that you have to do something. So the problem is big, but you have to start somewhere. If we want to see a carbon neutral, net zero carbon future, there's some diff different threads that we have to follow to get there. And we're not alone. One of those threads is to look at embodied carbon, which is the materials we use in our built environment. And to do that, um, we have to first of all attack the fact that some of these materials that we're advocating for are banned by the government. Timber logging is banned. So, okay, we need to have government stakeholders to deal with that. Um, we have to deal with the fact that people really believe that Timber is not something you build your houses, it's something you build your chicken sheds with. So you have to deal with advocacy in that part. You have to deal with the fact that timber is seen as a poor man's material, so how do you deal with advocacy with that? So at BuildX, we are pioneering the cross-laminated timber movement, and we are starting somewhere. Um, so right now, we have built a CLT, cross-laminated timber prototype. And CLT is a type of engineered timber engineered to be much stronger than ordinary planed timber. All over the world, CLT is being used to build high-rise towers. It's being used to build entire buildings. But how do you make people believe that, first of all, this structure will stand, it won't burn down? So you begin building that advocacy. And I'll say this very clearly, if you're using timber from sustainably commercial forests, so not timber that has been cut from an indigenous tree that is 500 years old, but commercially grown timber, which takes five to 10 years to grow, actually sequesters carbon. And because it's being turned into something productive, the carbon is never released again. So that's why a timber building is actually carbon negative. It's complicated, but it's something that we believe you have to start somewhere. If we are going to create a viable timber industry, in the next 10 years, we have to plant those trees now. Otherwise, then we'll create an amazing industry that wants timber, and then we have to cut our ind indigenous forests. So it becomes counterproductive. One of my greatest beliefs is that if affordable housing can be sustainable, then no one else has an excuse. And so for us to get to this net zero carbon future, we have now our affordable housing project, Zima Homes. And this is our pilot project, and we are planning on doing 10,000 homes in the next 10 years. At BuildX, we, we advocate for bio-based materials, natural materials such as earth, bricks, and timber. But our main tagline is that you use these materials, these natural materials, local materials within the local context, but using global technology to bring them into the future. So we're not saying that let's all go back home and build huts and earth huts to thatch. No, 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 no. We're saying that earth is a powerful material that is porous, that is good for the environment, that is thermally comfortable, that is available in your local context, that doesn't take a lot of carbon to ship from wherever it's coming from. So if you have earth on your site, why don't you use that to build your wall so that it's a bit more sustainable? But use compressed stabilized earth blocks to make them a bit more sustainable, to make them low maintenance. Um, so use global technology to be able to make this material uh, applicable in the current context. And then we have Build Her. Build Her was a company, is our sister company. And it's basically when we first started building in Kenya, we realized that all the construction sites are men. Um, and men are wonderful, we love you men, but construction sites are made for men. And so Build Her is a company that was created to train women in construction, to not only give them the hard skills of how do you manage yourself on site, how do you ensure that you're able to work on a construction site, but then also giving them the, the soft skills. And I'm starting from construction and masonry and artisan work, but it trickles all the way up to professionals like me. At the moment, I believe there 11% of registered architects in Kenya are women. 
how do we create enabling environments for inclusivity? And that's what Build Her is beginning to challenge, not just when it comes to training, but also creating the right environments and training men and people in construction. How do you handle women in this space? But then on the other side is, is also ownership. The built environment that is made by man, man built, man made built environment. So 1.5% is owned by women. So that means that literally 50% of the population don't feel ownership and feel secure and safe in the spaces that we're in. So even if I'm building a building and look at this wonderful office that we're in, it's owned by a man. So you're, you're wondering, how do I feel like I can be part of this space and, and, you know, and, and have an opinion within this sort of industry if we, can't, if we can't safely own it? So I'm questioning all you architects and professionals and developers and all these people, the things you're creating, have you asked your client if they've thought about this? You know, some, sometimes it's just about asking. Have you asked them a simple question like, when you're looking at your marketing model, do you ensure that the women have access to these or are you targeting rich people which often means men because the built environment cannot be owned by 50 percent of the population it's just not going to work it's important as as architects and professionals and historians and researchers that when you speak about the issues we're facing now and how we're going to tackle them that it's important to, to give that context and how do we make it less precarious so that people feel strong enough to build resilience in the way that they operate. I really want to encourage the young generation that you are the change. Take ownership of that change and that will help you to stop being pessimistic. Be optimistic because if you feel like you can do something, you will become hopeful and you will do that thing. Don't be worried about how big the problem is. Do one thing, do something and be the change that you want to see.